I did make a promise in my opening remarks and welcome that no matter what you brought in terms of weight or burden, that you were going to feel better, right? Well, I want to make my word bond to you. You know, the scripture says, tell us that we would be in bondage for a period of 400 years. And the scriptures also tell us that the enemy of God would impair our sight and our hearing and rob us of life that we would be left as dead. But the scripture didn't say we would be in that condition forever. And as we bore witness earlier of God's intervening in the affairs of those before us, today we can praise God and bear witness that God has indeed shown mercy on a people who were blind, deaf, dumb, and dead because God has intervened in our affairs and as a witness of God's presence among us, it is my extreme pleasure and joy to present to you at this time your brother and friend. You know him very well. He is the servant of God in our midst. Please help me to welcome the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. All praise is due to Allah, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. That means God is the greatest. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we give him praise and thanks for his mercy and his goodness to the members of the human family. We thank him for all of his prophets and the scriptures which they brought. We thank him for Moses and the Torah or the Old Testament. We thank him for Jesus and the Gospel. We thank him for Muhammad and the Quran. Peace be upon these worthy servants of Allah. I am a student of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and I could never thank Allah enough for him and the guidance that Allah gave him for us. We see him as a messenger, a messiah, and in time we believe that others will see him the same. I greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. I don't like the sound of this microphone. I've never heard it sound that echoing sound before. So while I'm talking, uh, I hope that you will correct the sound. Last week, I uh, took away from all of the laborers of the nation of Islam all their titles. And of course, this is like stripping somebody when you take away from them something that they glory in that makes a person feel he's different from 
or better than a person who does not have a title. Titles make some of us feel a sense of privilege that we can do what others cannot do. And we think we can get away with what we do because we wear some title. In this world, people strive for titles. And in this world, when you attain to some degree of proficiency in whatever your skill is, you get a title. So we go to college and we get proficiency in our studies and something is conferred on us. It's called a Bachelor of Science or Bachelor of Art degree and that's a great accomplishment. But what it does, it makes some think that that makes them better than the person who has not achieved such. And in this world, if you have a title, it confers on you honor and respect. But you may not be a good person, but, but you have a title. And people with titles somehow become an enemy to organization. Because we want to be known as this or that, and we want to strive for this position or that position, and the very thing that we strive for that allows us to have a title sometimes is the very means by which the very title begins to destroy organization, destroy nation. I have watched ever since I have been in the nation of Islam and ever since I grew up in the church, I watch people with titles. And I watch how we behave. And I have seen that we could be such beautiful people without a title and then the moment a title is conferred on us, all of a sudden, we become tyrants. We become oppressive. We can become mean-spirited. And we begin to look down on others because they don't have now the title that has separated us out from our brothers and our sisters. As I watched the nation, and I realized that Many of us have titles that we are not qualified to have. We have not made a study 
and shown ourselves worthy to have such a title. But it's conferred on us by whoever confers. And all of a sudden, we begin to think more of ourselves than we should. So today, I want to disabuse us of the sick mentality that comes with titles. Now, all of you that have a job somewhere, people are called managers, they're called foremen, they're called directors or directresses, they're called reverend, they're called imam, sheikh, they call your eminence, your grace, high potentate, <laughs> district attorney, mayor, your lordship, sir this and sir that, and lady this and lady that. And all of a sudden, I'm better than that person who's not titled like that. Then I started, start acting demonic. Because now I think I'm the law now. I'm not a servant of the law, but I have become the law. These kind of people which is us, destroy churches, they destroy mosques, they destroy progress, they destroy nations. I wonder what President Bush would be like as just plain old George W. Now, after commandeering an election and becoming the president of the United States of America, this man has acted as though he's a God, beside God, if you've seen old pictures of Caligula, if you've seen old pictures of Caesar, I mean, he has that swagger, you know. And you call a Negro up out of the ranks and give us any title, head broom sweeper. <laughs> then we are found beating the heck out of the other broom sweepers because I am the chief broom sweeper. thought that today I wanted to teach in a way that even though you're naked of a title, that you still have one. What? I do? Sure. <laughs> now, I'd like to introduce you 
to your title. A title given not by man, but a title given by Almighty God, Allah, our Creator. Before I do that, you know, we who are Muslims all over the world are observing a fast for 30 days during the month of Ramadan, which began last uh, Thursday, I believe. During this month of fasting, from the beginning of dawn to the dark, we neither eat any food nor drink any water. If we're married, we take no pleasure in a sexual relationship. The day is given to prayer, to the study of the Quran, which is the word that Almighty God Allah revealed to his servant, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and all through the month, we are students who impose a discipline on ourselves. There's nobody with a gun telling us don't eat, don't drink. We do it out of our love for God and our love for one another and our love for humanity. Why do we fast? You know, eating is very normal, natural, but there are a lot of people on our planet today who find it difficult to have one decent meal. I'm not talking about hundreds. I'm not talking about thousands. I'm not talking about millions. I'm talking about billions of people on our planet who live on a dollar or less a day. When we can eat three meals a day, or as many times as we feel like we want to eat something, what kind of compassion do we feel for the hungry, for the naked, for those that are out of doors? So we suffer, so we can feel what another human being is feeling that can't find food. We can find it, but we won't take it. There's water there, but we won't drink it no matter how harsh the sun is. We deprive ourselves of that which is natural so that we will have enough strength to discipline ourselves against what is unnatural. Now watch how this works. The Quran teaches that fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you. It's a prescription from the divine doctor, God himself, to help you live up to your title. 
to help you to see how you can handle your title without arrogance, without being excessively proud, without thinking more of yourself than you should. Forty days after Ramadan, the Muslims all over the world engage in the thought, if not the actual journey, called Hajj or pilgrimage to Mecca. I hope one day to take thousands to such a journey that I have been blessed to do many times. But when we reach Mecca, these garments you can't wear. Look at the nice suit that I have on. Does this make me better than my brother who doesn't have a suit on today? Come on, come on. Does it make me better than the young man out there who could barely find something to wear today? But if I'm a silly man, I will think that my suit makes me better than my brother who does not have it. So when we go to Mecca, all these things that separate one from the other, they're taken off. If you have a nice watch, you don't wear that. Take it off. I have cufflinks that have little diamonds in them. No, 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 take that off. any medallion that you have, take it off. Because when you go to the house of God, you don't come there with a title. God doesn't care if the king is coming, if the emperor is coming. If the prime minister is coming, when we go before God, we stand in ranks. No one better than the other. All of us standing before our creator and all the things that would make us think we are better, we've left them outside of Mecca. As uh, a black person brought up in America where our ego is crushed, where we've been made to feel that we're less than what we really are, boy, if I could just get a Cadillac. I'll go in debt. But when I come in the hood, driving my Cadillac or my Mercedes Benz or my BMW, please don't come with a Scion. Please don't come with this little teeny weeny car. You get no respect. But if you can roll out of a Rolls Royce, if you can step out of a BMW, then you watch a strut. I have arrived, y'all. Look at me. I am better than you because you came on a bicycle. 
And I came in a big car. And that's why you are killing yourself and others over some bling bling. Because the bling bling makes you think you are better than the person who does not have it. So I, I could go out and buy a nice pair of uh, tennis shoes, but I got to have Jordan latest. Why would I pay $180 for something that only took $4 or $5 to make? But no, 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 don't you bring me none of them cheap ones. Because when I walk in the hood, I got to show my buddies that I got on the best that they make. You do all these things thinking that it's giving you an advantage over somebody else. And the advantage only lasts for a moment. What is your real title? In the Quran, in the 30th chapter, the 30th verse, it says, so set your face for religion being upright. The nature made by Allah in which he has created men. And there is no altering Allah's creation. That is the right religion, but most people know not. See, religion ain't songs. Even as beautiful as you sing, that's a form of worship. And we think we can sing our way into heaven. Religion ain't preaching. Some of us are great preachers, but you can't preach your way into heaven. Real religion is that which produces the upright, the standard by which you measure yourself up to that. Whether you can sing or you can't sing, religion, which is from God, it is the nature in which he created you. And that is being upright. Wait, 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 wait. Just think. So when you look up the word upright, It is a strict regard for what is morally correct. Now we go to church, we go to the mosque, we go to the synagogue, we go to a place of worship, but are we living a morally correct life? Then if what you call religion does not inspire you to walk upright before God, then you need to set your face for the religion that causes you to be upright because that is the nature made by God in which he has created man and there is no altering Allah's creation. Well, when it says set your face, see, when a person is set, 
I used to run track, you know. On your marks. Get yourself together. But then the next command is the most serious one. Set. Now when you get set, you're in the position now to move out. But you can't move out until you hear the sound of the gun. Otherwise, it's a false start. But getting set in life for the journey of life. You're not set for that. And that's why life takes you down. The more you live it, the worse you get because you've never been set for life. And the worst part of this is Thank you. We think that being set means having a lot of money. That sure helps. It really helps. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with having money. So you could say, I'm set. I'm set. But when you think you're set, you find yourself upset because you've never really been set in the nature of God and in the nature in which he created you. So your purpose in life, you don't even know what it is. Everything that God created, he created it with a purpose. And the human being is the greatest of God's creation. But isn't it tragic that you don't know why you're here? The birds know. The bees know. The trees know. Even a small thing as a gnat has a purpose and fulfills it. But we are the greatest of God's creation and don't know even why we're here? That's very sad. Well, uh, I'm here to get education. And uh, when I get education, I get me a good job. Working for who? Well, it don't make no difference who I work for. Long as I get paid. When I get paid, I'm set. I got my 401k. And played the stock market. I'm pretty good. I, I get a little shaky sometime when the stock keeps slipping. All these things that you think have real value, what happens if the stock market falls and the dollar is weakening every day so you don't have the money? Mm. Have you lost your title? Go ahead, go ahead. Because you lost your job. I want you to think with me today. Yes, if you look up one morning and a fire, That's right. God forbid, burns down your house That's right. and you lose everything, have you lost your title? If the enemy comes yes, sir. and takes 
what you think is yours strips you like it happened to Job. If you lose everything that you think is valuable, if you have not lost who you are and your relationship to God, then whatever you lost, you can get it again and again and again and again and then some. face get a mental inclination or tendency toward what is morally correct be psychologically prepared yes, sir. to do what is right yes, sir. in a world as wrong as this world is if your mind is not set on what is right, you be drifting here and there. And before you know it, Satan will have you in his grip because he sets his laws up like a spider's web. And a spider's web only catches lightweight creatures and because you don't have weight real weight which comes from self-knowledge and the knowledge of God then you start selling drugs you start dealing in pimping and hustling and thieving and lying and cheating to get a dollar and the enemy is sitting there waiting on you. Uh-huh. Step over here, young man. What, what did I do? Nothing. You ain't got to do nothing. You black. <laughs> then I'll just start searching you now. And after I get finished searching you, searching you and find a little crack Aha, uh -huh. I got me another slave. Off you go to jail. This world is weighted, W-E-I-G-H-T-E-D, on you, particularly the black male. This is not a world favorable to you. And this is not a world that allows you to get set for moral correctness. Preachers preach, but are they mentally and psychologically prepared to do what is morally correct? Bush is the president, but is he set to do what is morally correct? He got a big title but he's not a big man. Now, if he came in the room, the president is at the door. Well, as out of respect, we would say, the president of the United States. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. And we would give him respect for the title that he wears. <laughs> I am not bowing down because of your title. When you know God, who has no partner, no equal, no associate, then you don't waste time 
bowing down to temporary powers. Yes, you the president today, but you may not be tomorrow. I can't worship you. You the king today, but you died and put another king on the throne. But my king, he's eternal, he's ever living. Nobody can take him out of office. So, in our lessons, the man who came to teach, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, put on us a title. And the title was Muslim. Well, what is a Muslim? That's a title. Please listen, this is very critical. A Muslim is one who submits his or her will to do the will of God. See, that's the nature in which you are created. You're not created to rebel against God. You're created to submit to God, and you know it. I don't care how ignorant you think you are. Just get in an airplane and the wind starts shaking it. The wife is sitting next to her strong, burly husband. She ain't saying, oh, husband. And he's not saying, oh, wife, or oh, captain. He's saying, oh, Lord. And he cries out, making his prayer sincere. So when Allah puts us in trouble, that's when we really make our prayers sincere. And look at what you say, Lord, Lord Jesus, help me. You hadn't prayed in a long time. But when you're in trouble, you know how to call him. You thought you had forgot his number. You didn't even have to go search in the directory. What, what's God's telephone number? <laughs> you dialed him up right away. And you was waiting to see if somebody was on the other end of the line listening. And then you said, Lord, I know I ain't been right. All the things you told me not to do, you know I've been doing them. But Lord, you even put a little song in it, you know what I mean? If you answer me this one time, I'll serve you the rest of my days. See, you already know that your purpose in life is to serve the creator who gave you life. You know that. So really, you are born with a title. And, 
What is the title? It is an appellation or a name of dignity, honor, and distinction or preeminence attached to a person or family by virtue of rank, office, precedent, privilege, attainment. Now, you didn't do nothing to get that title. You just have to come here. And you already have a title that's greater than any title that could be conferred on us by man. Listen, you've heard me say this before. I'm going to say it again. The Quran has never said, die not, unless you die the death of an emperor. Die not unless you die the death of Lady Diana, <laughs> Earl so-and-so, High Potentate so-and-so. Quran never says nothing like that. The Quran doesn't even recognize another title like that. The Quran says, die not unless you die in submission to the will of God. Die not unless you are a Muslim. So that title, Muslim, submitting to the will of God, he didn't give it to you and not me, or me and not you. Every human being that is born that is not a devil is given that title. I am born by nature a Muslim. That's why when some of my Arab brothers came to me and said, we're very happy that you have accepted our religion. Wait, wait, wait. When did it become yours? and not mine. I am not a Muslim because there was a prophet named Muhammad. Swallow that one deep. I am not a Muslim because there was a man named Jesus. I am not a Muslim because there was a man named Abraham who is the father of the righteous. I was before Abraham. And so were you. That is the nature of God and the nature in which he created every human being. That is your title. Now how do you wear it? person has a title, they want to be able to wear it properly. <laughs> well, how do we wear such a title? Born to submit my will to do the will of God but I'm born knowing nothing. The Quran says, you were born knowing nothing, I'm born knowing nothing. So all of us come into the world equal. Look at this. But you all, female, oh, what a great, position you have with God. You as a woman should never look down on yourself, abuse yourself, or allow any man 
to take you for some cheap object of pleasure, but not the serious creation that Almighty God has created you. Let me show you how we work our way into a title. Let me show you. You're the mother. I'm talking to mama now. And if your mother, as mine, has passed away, I want you to think on her as I speak about mother. She produced us. Her womb was the laboratory that God worked in. I'm going to come out one of these Sundays and teach you how to get a child that is the like of John or the like of Mary, the blessed one, the most honored woman of all women that ever lived is Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was not an accident. And the same way she came into existence, you can bring into existence the like of her. I'll get into that at another time. But for today, when you produce a child, that child comes into the world complete yet incomplete. It cries out to you, mother, for a need, a need. Think about that. A need. Lord have mercy. This is so good. You're in the bed trying to sleep, mother, and the baby cries, Dad, still sleep? <laughs> if he wake up, get that baby. Shut <laughs> up. Not you. You deny yourself sleep to come to your child. If the child is hungry, you either warm up a bottle or you put the baby to your breast. And by sufficing the needs, listen to me carefully, of your child, you bombed that child to you by service. That's right. I say it again. After a while, the baby cries again, you answer. And every time you answer, the cry of what you produce by the grace of God, the baby bonds more and more to you. And the baby begins to adore you and coo. And then it learns to say, Mama, before it learns to say, God. Because in that instance, you are the representative of God. And because of your service to your child, that child grows up with an adoration for mama. And when time and the God of time takes mama away, it's like there's a hole in your being because the one that nurtured you, the one that was there for you when you fell down and bruised your knee or busted your lip or put your hand too close to the fire 
or fell in the yard when you were playing or got in an accident. But mama was there serving, serving, serving. She's bigger than you. She's older than you. She's wiser than you. But everything that she knows, she puts it in service to her offspring. That's the example of how you maintain your title. And this is why in the fourth chapter of the Quran, it says, O oh people, keep your duty to your Lord who created you from a single being and created its mate of the same kind and spread from these two many men and women. Once you come into the world and learn how to love your mother because your mother has been dutiful to you, has served you, the lesson that mother is teaching the child as you grow in life, when you've outgrown mama, you can never outgrow God. So the service that she rendered to you that made you indebted to her is the same service we must render to God that he may show us his favor. Oh people, keep your duty to your Lord. How beautiful is that? See, the Bible constantly speaks of love. That's such a beautiful word, so easily misunderstood. But duty? No, 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 no. Duty is not so easily misunderstood. I love you. Oh, darling. I love you. I love you so much. I can't breathe without you. And your mushy madness. How could you love a woman that didn't give you life more than you love the creator who gave you life and gave you the life of the woman that you say you love? or the children that you say you love. You know, you, you, you got it all messed up. That's why, you know, sometimes I get sick of hearing these stupid songs. I can't get along without you, baby. Who the heck is she that I can't get along without her? Why would I put a woman in the place of God? See, and when you talk to her like that and treat her like that, you pull her out of her natural place. She is not a God beside Allah. No man should worship a woman. And no woman should worship a man. I'm getting there. See, duty is not confusing. Love is. See, love can be a noun. Love is a tender feeling of one human being for another. That's a noun. And most of us are in the noun phase. But when you say, I love 
you. I is the subject of the sentence. Love is a verb which carries action and you are the object of my love. Therefore, if I love you, you will see my actions proving my love. So a duty is an obligatory task. It's an obligation we are bound to perform. It's conduct and service or function that arise out of one's position. Well, what is my position in relationship to my creator. How could I be anything to him but a servant? How could I stand up before my creator? Hey, creator, come here a minute. I mean, I'm down here catching hell. You know what I'm saying? Why you gonna leave me like this? Now some of us are jack tail enough to talk to the creator like that and wonder why you don't get an answer. See, the very nature of your creation doesn't allow you to speak to the creator like that. You talk to him, you appeal to him, you beg him. You cry and you pour out your heart to him for relief. That's your position. So the Quran says, keep your duty. Well, what is my duty to my Lord? What can I give him that he don't have? I can't go out <coughs> to Neiman Marcus. If I could afford their high-priced junk, I can't go out to Walmart. This is for the Lord. <laughs> He's owner of everything, possessor of everything. He's self-sufficient. What can I give him? But what is it that I should give him? See? I should honor him, I should praise him, I should thank him for the eyes that he gave me to see his creation, for the ears he gave me to hear, for the tongue he gave me to speak, for the brain he gave me to think, for the hands that he gave me to form what I think in my head and bring it with my hands for the feet he gave me to walk for the heart he gave me to beat who can give a gift like what he gives but if somebody give you a new pair of shoes somebody give you a diamond ring somebody buy you a car you almost getting on your knees but you won't get on your knees to the God who has given us everything Oh, by the way, my subject is <laughs> we must first be brothers. See, after you have the title, I'm a Muslim, you are. Well, you may say, I'm a Christian, I'm not accepting such a name as Muslim. It's okay, it's all right. Jesus was a Muslim. What did you say, minister? Wait. You all right? 
if Muslim means one who submits his will to do the will of God, listen to Jesus' words. Whatsoever the Father bids me to say, that I say. Whatsoever the Father bids me to do, that I do. He was so completely submissive to the Father that when the disciples said, when can we see the Father? He said, have not I been among you all this time and you have not seen him? When you see me, you see the Father. For I am in the Father and the Father is in me, me and my Father are one. See, now, look, look, look. You can't become one with God unless we surrender completely to God. Then when you surrender to him, he starts bringing you forward to him. So many Muslims ask me, Minister, I, Minister, I, I want you to tell me, what is my purpose in life? Don't ask me, I didn't create you. <laughs> Tell me, minister, what can I do to help? I don't know. See, I knew the minister was stupid. He don't know, see? <laughs> Some of us would be crazy like that. No, how do I know you? Don't assign to me powers that I don't have. He looked at me. And I knew he saw deep into me. And all I got to do is ask him. I know he got the answer. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Brothers and sisters, If I've been in your head today and in your house today, it's not because I know you. It's because God knows you. And I'm trying to be a good servant of God. So as I stand up to preach his word, he uses me as an instrument to answer some of your questions or your desires or your hurts or your pain. But it's not that I know you. Am I making sense? I guess... I hope I didn't miss my point. Oh, one of those senior moments, you know. <laughs> um, yes. Now, you can't be a brother to the brother sitting next to you. You can't be a brother to the sister, and you can't be a sister to your sister until you first understand who you are and the title that God has given you, and you are making steps to live up to your title. Now watch this. He says, keep your duty to your Lord who created you from a single being and created its mate of the same kind or essence and spread from these two many men and women. So it means that human beings have a common 
ancestry. Uh -oh. Common. Who did we come from? Well, the Bible says Adam, the Quran says Adam. That's okay. But where did Adam come from? Where did Eve come from? See, God creates us from himself. So the same nature that is in God is in you. Now, well, listen, I'm going through it now. I want you to work with me. Because I'm going to come out of Bible, Quran. I don't care what book we got. We're going there. But I want you to understand your title. You mean I am a direct descendant of God? I'm in that line that if you go back far enough on that line, you come right to him who originated the heavens and the earth. That's right. How could that be? See, let's take it from the biblical point of view first. The Bible says... He created Adam. And then it said, he created male and female. This is before Eve even came into existence. Go back and pick up the Genesis and read. Male and female created he them. Them. Same thing the Quran said. Then it says, he made the man in his own image and after his own likeness. Well, have you been on the Marmory Povich show lately? Whose baby daddy is this? See, the DNA ain't right. You mean this child I got don't look like me? Then maybe I, maybe I ain't the daddy then. And you see the woman on the show, yes, he's the father. And next week, here comes somebody. Well, I made a mistake. Maybe, yeah, but I had sex with this one, this one, this one, that one, the other one. So they take the DNA and then Maury comes back. I'm very sorry, lady. <laughs> None of these is the father. Now, beloved, your DNA links you straight back to the originator of the heavens and the earth. If I'm made, from the Bible standpoint, in his image and after his likeness, then when you see me, you're seeing a small reflection of my creator. All right. Well, the Muslim will say, well, that ain't the Quran. So let's, that's the Bible. Okay, let's go to the Quran. The Quran says, he created Adam. And he made Adam 
his Khalifa. Now wait now. Break that word down, brother, because I don't know what that means. Me neither till I looked it up. <laughs> he made Adam his Khalifa. And when you look up the word Khalifa in Arabic, it means one who takes the place of another, who succeeds another, who has died. or passed on. Well, we know that God is the ever living. But man can succeed God? Man can be Khalifa to stand in the place of God? Then if I and you and we can stand in his place, then in us is the ability to reflect him perfectly if we surrender and submit our will to do the will of God. Why would God let man stand in his place if man couldn't handle it. Ah, you got to talk to me now because this Quran says he never gives a human being a duty beyond its scope. So if I can stand in the place of God by his permission, then look at where I am. I never knew that I had that kind of ability. I've been so disrespectful of myself. No wonder I like to get high. What you mean, Farrakhan? When I was coming up many, many years ago, some of the things that we would say to our peers, I got, I got high last night, brother. Well, how did you get high? Why did you want to get high? Because you were low. Why did you want to get high? Because it's your nature to reach up. But you don't have to use drugs to get up. You just have to surrender your will to do the will of God and degree by degree by degree, he'll raise you up. Look at what he did for his prophets. Look at what he did for Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. Look at what he did for Jesus. He can do the same for you and me. So live up to your title. Now, if the first stage of living up to my title is keeping my duty to Allah, and that's a great step forward. But you wear the same title that I wear. She wears the same title that we wear. So we are, in reality, family. See, you go to college. How many of you are in a sorority? Would you raise your hand? Don't be bashful. Raise them up high. Come on. How many of you are in a fraternity? Raise your hand. How many of you are Masons? Shriners? See, these are fraternities and sororities 
that make you a brother based on certain principles of belief and practice. Am I right? Okay, so if you're a Delta or an AKA or a Sigma or an Omega or an Alpha or a Kappa, whatever that fraternity is, that's cool. But it's, it's so limited. Because you're an Omega and you meet an Alpha, he don't have the same password, he don't give the same signal, so that's not your brother? Wait, I'm coming to something. I'm coming to something. I'm a BD. I'm a GD. I'm a stone. See, these are brotherhoods. that sisters belong to, too. Well, it's all right. I mean, you could be a BD, a GD, a stone, a vice lord, or whatever you want to call yourself. But look how limited that is. Because if a BD meet a GD, he ain't got the right, you know, whatever that is. He ain't wearing the right color, you know what I mean? That ain't my brother, that's my enemy. Stop! BD, GD, Stone, Alpha, Omega, Kappa, Sigma, Delta, that was not in the beginning. Wait a minute. Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian, Catholic, Jehovah Witness. Come on! That was not in the beginning. I'm a Reformed Jew. I'm an Orthodox Jew. I'm a this kind of Jew. That was not in the beginning. Hell, I don't want to know what Moses was. I don't want to know what Jesus was unless you can take me back to the origin of what God made the first human being before there was a Christian, before there was a Jew. There was God, there was human beings, and there was God giving instructions. That is his religion. Follow my instruction. Obey my command. Submit yourselves. And I will make you great in the earth. So the real brotherhood begins from God. And all of us are brothers, sisters. When I'm looking at you, I'm looking at a piece of my creator. So like Jesus said, how can I love God whom I have never seen and hate my brother whom I see every day? What is in my brother that I should not hate? My brother is created in the same nature as myself. 
He's created in the same nature of all of God's creation. I mean, the sun is great. It obeys a law. So does the moon, so do the stars, so do the planets, so does all life. But you and I, God shows us so much respect. He never forces us to bow down. He only invites us. There is no compulsion in religion. The right way is clearly distinct from error. God loves you and he respects you, but he wants you to come to him, not by force, but by recognizing who he is and surrendering. Now watch how this works. If I'm a Muslim, meaning I'm born to submit my will to do the will of God, and I keep my duty first to my Lord, and then it says, and keep your duty to Allah by whom you demand one of another your rights and to the ties of relationship. Now there are demands that our nature makes on us with each other. Watch this now. I'm your brother, right? You invite me to your house. That's a brotherly thing to do. You say, Farrakhan, sit down and have some soup. But I look, I said, man, this cat got a pretty wife. And she brought me my soup and she kind of looked at me nice. So is that brotherly for you to covet my wife, my daughter? You like my daughter? See me. Don't come through no back door talking to my child. You better come see me because when you do that, you're violating the principle of brotherhood. Then I can deal with you. Listen now. Listen to this. You selling dope. I'm not talking to anybody specific. I'm just laying out a principle here. You selling dope, you give me some to sell. Not that I would, but I'm making a statement here, an allegorical situation. But now I'm selling, but I go home and I cut it. By cut it, I mean I weaken it so I could sell more and more get more money because I owe the dope man. Now, I should be able to pay the dope man because I done sold the dope, but I was using myself. And one of the rules is you don't get high on your own supply, right? Excuse me, I, I learned that from others I don't know nothing about. It. Now look at this. When he don't come straight to you, you trusted him with the crack or the heroin or the cocaine, whatever it was, and he don't come back. You say, this dude, he playing a game with me. So you ride up on him. They call it a drive-by. 
And sometimes you don't care, you kill him, but then you go get his mama, you go get his daughter, but what did you do that for? Because he didn't act right.
you need to be ministered unto. Sit down. But from the front door, yes, sir. the minute you get on this property, I want the people to understand that in this house, yes, we love them, yes. there's peace here, and we have a duty to them, and they must know that this belongs to them. Those of you who stand in place in the FOI and the MGT classes, yes, sir. hold your place, but don't act like you are who you are. Just learn to be a good servant. Right. That's right. I want to see how well you serve. Yes, sir. Do you tip a waiter and don't know how to serve? No, sir. Nasty? Throw the food down? No. So how in the world can we expect charity? That's right. Right, right. If you treat the believer like he's supposed to give you something. Be a good servant. And watch how God will grow you personally. Watch how Allah will grow the mosques and watch how fast we can make his word bond. Yes, sir. Ramadan Mubarak. Ramadan. I'd like to ask Mr. Marcus Jones and Melissa Bell, the mother and father of Michael Bell, the youth arrested as an adult in the Jenna 6 trial in Jenna, Louisiana. Would you please stand? Where's the father? Thank you. Thank you. Now these are our family members. They don't have to belong to a mosque for us to fight for them and with them. Their son and other children have been wrongfully arrested in Louisiana and we do not intend to let them suffer like this. Our unity Backing them will get justice for them and all the Jenna Six. Thank you, mother and father, for your visit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have as a guest Dr. Ali M. Jaffrey, PhD, Professor of Biological Sciences at Malcolm X University. Would you please stand, doctor? Thank you. We are honored to have you, our dear brother. May Allah bless you. He is a part of our Muslim family that has come to the United States seeking a better life, never seeking to do America harm, but because we are Muslims, yes, today the climate is being whipped up of hatred against Muslims. I want the government to know from my mouth we will not let anybody, black or white, or anything in between, make a nuisance 
on or near our post. And our post is 3,000 by 2,000 miles called the United States of America. We're not going to let no terrorism take place on our watch. If we find you, we'll break your damn neck and then turn you over to the enemy. You will not kill innocent people for political purposes. Now, there's no Palestinian that has a greater right to hate than we do. If you don't know our history, we know ours and yours. But we're not strapping no bombs on ourselves to hurt nobody. See, look, these little Rudy Poop terrorists. Oh, we're not going to allow that on our watch. No, sir. But pardon me. Yes, sir. I ain't got nothing to do with the drought. <laughs> I don't have anything to do with the fire that's on the West Coast right. or the floods on the East Coast and the storms and the wind and the rain and the famine and the pestilence and the earthquake soon to come, that's out of our hands. Right. We can stop a little cheap terrorist, right. but we can't stop the wrath of God when it comes down on Jenna, Louisiana, for the evil and injustice of those people, or comes down on America for her evil done to us and to others. Thank you for listening, and may Allah bless you. As I greet you in peace, Assalamu alaikum. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar.